Hello, I'm John Butler, Investment Director at South Bank Investment Research, and I'm joined today by Godfrey Bloom. Godfrey has had a long, distinguished, and perhaps most importantly, varied career as a British Army officer, as a professional and executive in the city of London, and also as a member of the European Parliament for Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. While in the European Parliament and after, he campaigned for Brexit and continues to champion British independence and the British national interest every chance he gets. But it's that long and varied and distinguished career and experience that I believe provides Godfrey the sort of skill set that we absolutely need today if we're going to start thinking seriously about how we're going to solve the problems we face and the mess we're in. So I'm sure you'll welcome Godfrey Bloom. Godfrey, thank you for joining me today. Well, a pleasure to be invited, John. Thank you so much. Well, look, um, it just seems to me that we really are in quite a mess, a multidimensional mess, if you'd like to say, one that could uh, benefit from your expertise and knowledge and experience. Uh, I mean, there are just so many problems today along so many different dimensions. I almost don't know where to begin. I, I, what, what do you think are the most pressing issues we face and how might we begin to, to confront them and, and deal with them? Well, you're right, uh, John, there's so many, but I think I really need uh, to start. I think the most pressing thing at the moment uh, is the danger that we have of slipping into a world war, which we did in 1914, almost blindfold, and historians, and I am one of them, who still look back in July 2000, uh, 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 1914 to wonder how the hell we got into such a mess. And it started small. It started in Bosnia. Uh, it started uh, uh, with the uh, lineup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire against Serbia. And then Russia supported uh, Serbia. And then the German Empire decided it really had to support the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, then it drew in the French. And we felt that we had to support the French, something which I think to this day was a tragic mistake. And it cost the British Empire three million war casualties and the dem demise uh, and the fall of the British Empire and none no good came of it now I've lectured on this at many many universities and I've written uh, a lot about it but I seem to see the same thing developing now we have uh, in the Ukraine uh, we have a massive propaganda campaign uh, which is uh, run by the uh, United States Military Industrial Congressional Complex, uh, the CIA and MI6. It's a massive propaganda campaign um, that we haven't really seen in this form since perhaps the North Press of, of 1914, 1915, 1916. Wow. So the man on the Clapham omnibus, uh, which the British would call it, and of course Joe Sixpack, uh, where the Americans might call it, have been sold one line and one line only for the last three years, that the Russian Federation invaded Ukraine totally unprovoked for no reason whatsoever, except Putin and the Russian people are evil. This is simply absurd. And I've had Colonel Doug McGregor on my channel and many other uh, top uh, uh, historians and analysts and military analysts. They're not allowed on mainstream media. So if I go to my pub, the Wheat Chief in Howden, for example, it's full of Daily Express readers who are absolutely convinced that one day Putin woke up with a sore head because he's had too much vodka and he decided to invade the Ukraine because he was bored. That is the general perceived view in the West. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's very, very worrying. And the escalation is happening slice by slice as... The UK, Ukraine army, the, the NATO proxy army, is losing, as I said it was on all my blogs and podcasts and articles, three or four years ago. You cannot fight the Russians in their backyard. Uh, and it was interesting to give you a quote from the, uh, the staff college at Cambly, the British Army Staff College, in 1946, uh, when Bernard Montgomery, Field Marshal Montgomery, was giving a lecture. Uh, and... 
uh, somebody in the audience said who were senior army officers, war hardened uh, officers said, Field Marshal, can you give us one? Can you give us one tip that you, we could take away? One thing to take away as we as we finish our term at the, the college. And he said, yes, he said, I can do that quite easily in one sentence. Never march on Russia. <laughs> And well, <laughs> we didn't listen to him, and we're not listening now. Well, there's plenty of historical evidence to suggest that getting into a land war in Asia is an extremely bad idea. Uh, and of course, yes, that, that, would, that would include modern day uh, Russia. I can ap absolutely appreciate your concern. Uh, there are many people who are concerned. And it's also concerning, perhaps, that the, uh, the, the government and media have perhaps not been quite as forthcoming as they might have been and indeed might have even been spinning uh, some tall tales uh, to try to get public support for what is an extremely dangerous policy position. Do, do you think there is any chance that the upcoming UK election might see any meaningful change in the country's foreign policy stance in this regard? No, I don't, sadly, because Parliament has now abrogated itself completely from the running or, or the strategic or tactical running of uh, Great Britain. It's gone. It's been gone for some years, or certainly it's been reducing for some years. Um, uh, Sunak and his predecessors were World Economic Forum stooges, and they have been stooges. Keir Starmer is a self-confessed stooge. Uh, when he was asked at the last Davos meeting, the one that's just gone, I think it was, he said, well, where, where do you think the influence should be? Should it be, or where is it coming from? What is your view, Mr. Starmer or Sir Keir? Got a knighthood. God knows how he got that, but they seem to be handing them out like cigarettes these days. But <laughs> and he said, and Keir Starmer said, he said, oh, Davos. Davos is where the action is. Davos is what it's all about. So... It doesn't matter. Everybody in the United Kingdom at the moment, no, it's not going to make one whit of difference uh, if Sunak, who is an ex-Goldman Sachs uh, World Economic Forum stooge, is replaced by another self-confessed stooge. So the West is now run wholly by the World Economic Forum. So there won't be any change uh, in, in an election in the United Kingdom because we don't run our own foreign policy. Our foreign policy is run by Washington and has been for decades. So it doesn't matter who we vote for in North America, France, England. You can't change the system by voting it out. That's the tragedy. Well, and it sounds like what you're saying doesn't only apply to foreign and military affairs, but also to economic affairs. You, you mentioned the Chancellor of the Exchequer a moment ago. Uh, I recently interviewed Bob Lydon, who's recently published a report uh, about uh, Rachel Reeves' plans uh, in the event that Labour does form the next government. And he's concerned that what she would do on economic policy would be just to extrapolate what Blair and Brown were doing and the legacy that they left us, which of course includes the global financial crisis of 2008-9 and all the unprecedented measures that were taken to contain that. You've written extensively on economics as well, including the so-called Austrian School of Economics, which is highly, highly critical of modern economic policy, including the way central banking is implemented. Do you see any hope <laughs> that there's any progress that we could make uh, somehow on the economic front following the elections? Uh, no, I don't, because it's just more of the same. And they're really quite up front, it's more of the same. Now, I sat for five years in the European Parliament on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. Uh, that's just the committee I was sitting on, which was quite interesting, because it was largely full of Danish housewives, uh, Belgian socialists, uh, uh, Bulgarian trade unionists, so on and so forth. So that committee had no more idea about economic strategy than fly to the moon. But then, of course, neither do the central banks. So all the leaders of the central banks, and I mentioned this at the time when the new man took over from uh, Carney, he was a box sticker. They're box stickers. Uh, they're told what to do by the IMF and the Bank of uh, International Settlements, uh, all part of the UN, and it's all part of the WEF program. And, of course... What old chaps of my age know as Keynesianism is now called modern modern monetary theory. 
it's exactly the same thing. It is the idea, basically, <clears throat> that if you are a government, the basic rules of economics don't apply to you. If you continue, John, to spend more money than you actually earn, you'll go bankrupt. If you have a company that continues to spend more than it, uh, than it can raise in profit, will go bankrupt. But there is this feeling that that doesn't apply somehow to countries. Uh, but of course it does. And they say, ah, yes, but how can the United States go bankrupt? How can Britain go bankrupt? Because they can print money. Well, yes, of course they can print money. But of course, it's only a life support machine. That's not, that, that, that doesn't really work. Because what you've got is a situation where the money is totally degraded. We're seeing that degraded all the time. Uh, year by year and it doesn't matter whether it's a dollar the yen uh, the euro it doesn't matter what it is it's degraded and of course as an austrian school economist i would argue and if you look for and, and our definition of inflation of course is monetary inflation not the cpi uh, or, 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 or ipi that right. kind of thing that that's something outside the thing it's monetary inflation so where does that leave us where does that take us well if you look at uh, when nixon closed the gold window in 19 uh, 70 and I was around at the time uh, 71 I think it was uh, I was around at the time and he brought gov he brought the dollar off the gold standard uh, so he could fight a war you could trace this back you know nearly 800 years if you take if you take your if you degrade your currency if you degrade your currency it's usually to fight wars and no good ever comes of it because no good ever comes of a war you nobody really wins at the end of the day and if you degrade your currency if you see the demise of the Roman Empire. It was the failure to control borders that brought down the Roman Empire and the degradation of their currency. Ringing any bells? <laughs> you know, is this ringing any bells? Uh, and of course, if you peg it against gold, for example, uh, from 1971, as you'll know, and, uh, and I'm sure everybody in your channel, and do excuse me for teaching granny to suck eggs, John, forgive me for this. Uh, but if you but if you take the uh, dollar as purchasing power as against gold uh, today, uh, it's now uh, in the region of six cents. Uh, the the collapse of the United States dollar, the reserve currency, and of course other currencies have collapsed even more. Uh, even the Swiss franc uh, has collapsed, but albeit not to the extent of um, uh, the United States dollar, but it's still degraded quite significantly. Now, so. This is the problem. This is the problem that you degrade money. Uh, and then, of course, people come out of the woodwork with another brilliant idea. And the next brilliant idea, of course, is central banking, digital country, uh, central bank's digital country, which, of course, uh, is then programmable, which gives you your World Economic Forum uh, desire, your United Nations and so on and so forth. Uh, your WHO, all these people are locked together in this one system, programmable. And of course, believe it or not, I'm old enough to remember rationing uh, in the war. There were still one or two ration books. Although I was born in 1949, there were a few ration books around when I was three or four still uh, on one or two uh, one or two things in 1952, 53. And I remember the books you know, uh, in, in the kitchen from my mother. Uh, we will be told how much you can have. So go into the butcher. If you went into the butcher in 1944, you've had your ration of sausage. Uh, you've had your ration of whatever it may be. You've got your little bit of meat on the same with the, uh, all the other things. Uh, you're rationed. Your petrol is rationed. Uh, this is what they want to do. Uh, and if it's programmable, you will go in, you'll have your card, you'll have your digital currency, and they will say, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Butler, uh, you had enough train and rail travel or air travel this year, you're out. You can't go anywhere. Uh, you, uh, or to the ordinary people, it'll be, you know, you've had enough holidays. Or you can't drive your car. You've got perfectly good public transport. You must use public transport. Or you've had enough steak or meat or corned beef, whatever it is. And, of course, we know this is going to happen. We know this is going to happen because we also know, know that every single banker and every single politician lies as soon as they open their mouth. <laughs> so the... So we know that when the uh, Bank of England uh, governor and other bank, bank, uh, central bank governor said, no, no, we won't program it. Uh, we won't do this. You know that that means they will do it. That's why they, if they deny something, I remember 
the political program we had years ago, some of your uh, uh, viewers might know about it, was um, uh, Yes, uh, Yes Minister. Yeah, Yes Minister, yeah. And that was very funny because uh, one civil servant and, 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 uh, uh, and, and talking to the Prime Minister said, oh, oh my goodness me, the Treasury is publicly denied it. And then the response was, oh God, so it is true. <laughs> right. <laughs> Exactly. Well, it, it, it is important in these times to keep a sense of humor. I know many people who are deeply concerned about the state of the economy and about the prospect of the future introduction of a central bank digital currency and the fact that that would, in theory, completely do away with financial privacy and, as you point out, could also be used as a tool to enforce de facto rationing of certain uh, types of consumer goods. Um, it all sounds a bit dystopian, but it is concerning that that sort of technology uh, not only does now exist in principle, but that so many people in power are talking about how they might implement that technology in practice. Most of our viewers today are self-directed investors. Uh, they tend to be quite defensive and conservative regarding protecting their wealth. Would you have any advice any advice, notwithstanding how grim this all sounds, any advice what measures they might take to try and protect themselves in this very, very concerning uh, world that we're entering into? Well, I would argue, and I managed pension funds for many years with Mercury Asset Management and other big players in the pension field, uh, and where a conservative investment view was actually de rigueur. You had to be conservative because you had to pay people's pensions when they retired. Right. So you had to be very careful. Now, having said that, the bond market is in a precarious position, as I used to let, do some commercial lecturing at uh, Institute of Banking and stuff like this. <clears throat> if interest rates start to go up, the capital value of your bonds fall. Uh, that, to, to you and I, of course, that's basic common sense. We know that, you know, that's a given. Mm. <clears throat> but it's not generally speaking fully understood by people uh, that your capital value will fall uh, as interest rates go up. That puts bonds in a very precarious position right. uh, because there's all talk now about interest rates coming down and inflation being, being stopped or, or, or cured, which isn't true. Uh, as any housewife watching this will tell you, she knows that to be the case. Uh, so again, we're being lied to. And if you have interest rates, even if you take T-bills, for example, let's say they're moving to four, four and a half percent or even five percent. We know that that doesn't meet inflation. We know that. So we know that your money is being degraded. So where you might normally go for bonds, uh, U.S. Treasury bills. <coughs> who would have thought a bank or banks in America could go broke uh, or become insolvent with 100 um, percent T-bills? You would have thought they'd be the last bank to fall. Uh, quite the opposite, because they didn't understand if interest rates go up, the capital value falls. So you hold them to, you can hold your bonds to maturity. Uh, but if inflation, and I use uh, and, and high street inflation as opposed to monetary inflation, if you use that, you're going to be losing five or six percent of the value of your spending power, of your savings forever. Now, there's only one thing that I believe that you can circumnavigate that, uh, and that is gold in specie. Mm. Uh, that, that is my call. Uh, gold in specie, there's no counterparty risk, and it stood the test of time, one might argue, for 5,000 years. <laughs> so that, uh, is, that is what I like. And as far as UK uh, investors are concerned, and I don't know enough about the tax position of other countries, of course, if you buy sovereigns, which is coin of the realm, or Britannia's a coin of the realm, there's no VAT on gold sovereigns or gold Britannia's, uh, and there's no capital gains tax. So you're in a very tax-advantaged situation, and historically, it, um, it protects you against inflation over the long term. And if I may give, a, if I may give an example of that, in 1816 or 1817, um, when after the Napoleonic Wars were finished oh. and we'd thrashed the French again, <laughs> tee -hee, um, the we went back onto the gold standard. So there was um, sovereigns, the, the gold sovereign, that's when it sort of manifested itself. 
And because we were on the gold standard, if one accepts that the staple, the staple commodity of the 1800s, for example, was bread, which I don't think is an unreasonable supposition, uh, uh, the value of a loaf, the price of a loaf of bread in 1816 was exactly the same as it was in 1913, because we stayed on the gold standard. And if you take perhaps from, let's say, 1900, for example, if you take the staple commodity, global needed commodity, must have, I would suggest, is oil. And if you look at the price of oil against gold from about 1900 onwards to today, you'll find it spooky. It's really spooky. You will find it's exactly the line on your graph goes exactly in tandem. Uh, and so it shows that it preserves your purchasing power. And but you must hold it in specie. If you can't, if you want a lot of it and you want to, uh, you want to take delivery. Obviously, you might be worried. You, you might have to go to uh, a safety deposit uh, uh, institution. I don't mean banks. Banks are owned by governments. They can steal it. And that brings me on to. Uh, arguments I sometimes have with Bitcoiners. Uh, Bitcoins are fairly evangelical about Bitcoin, which is understandable um, because we both agree gold bugs and Bitcoiners is that the only way to save, pre preserve yourself is to take your money off the table, walk away from the table. You have to get out of the casino system and you have to rely on what you've got. Now, that's that's fine. That's fine. But you must you must control your gold and you must control obviously your Bitcoin wallet wise. Uh, and I would say as a, an addendum to that on Bitcoin, no good will ever come of people like BlackRock running ETFs on Bitcoin. The whole point of Bitcoin was that people like uh, Larry Fink couldn't get their greasy mitts on it. All right. But no, if you let them in through the back door, you'll find they will manipulate in much the same way as they've manipulated with years the price of precious metals. And if you think that you're safe because you're the only one that has your code, think Julian Assange. The government can suspend habeas corpus. They can lock you up in solitary confinement. How long before, you, they, before people break and give their code for their wallet in Bitcoin? I doubt most Bitcoiners wouldn't last more than a week about a week before they cried uncle. Well, I'm sure that's true of most people uh, generally who are imprisoned against their will for a crime that's not even a crime and in which they possibly don't even understand uh, in sort of the, the spirit of Kafka or something <laughs> such as that. Um, well, look, uh, that, that I'm sure is helpful advice. I'm sure that will be taken on board uh, by our viewers who might also like to learn more about your work and your most recent book. Could you let us know uh, where they could find um, some of your work and let let them know where they could find your, your recent book. Uh, that's very kind. All my books, uh, my recent, all the books are available. All the articles I've written in the past for various magazines are still there um, because even though some were written five or six years ago, uh, they've all proved to come true, uh, particularly on things like the Ukraine and banking and, and, and the de degradation of money. Um, my wife's view is that the, the reason I have no mates is because I'm always right <laughs> and nobody likes a smart ass. Um, but if you doubt me, if you go to my website, nothing's ever been taken down in embarrassment. Uh, it's just simple. It's godfreybloom.uk. Uh, and everything you need is there. There's a health page. There's a gold page. The gold pages, I gather, my producer told me that that is the uh, most comprehensive not-for-profit gold page in Britain today. Uh, there's health, uh, there's gold, uh, and um, there's climate. So if you want to know the truth uh, about uh, climate science and so on, you'll find top experts. I only edit, incidentally. I edit uh, my own work is there, but it's edited and it's top, including Alistair MacLeod and people uh, of, of, of that kind of thing. So uh, that that's it. And I think people might in, in, enjoy having a look at it. I do welcome comment. Anybody's got any input, you will get a reply. I repeat, it's not for profit. It's pro bono publico. Uh, I'm an old geezer now. 
uh, and uh, I don't need to make any money, although I need to pay my techie and stuff I don't understand. So advertising does make a little bit of money, but it's not for profit. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Understood. And I'm sure that our viewers appreciate that. And I'm sure that many of them will go to your website and have a look at your past work as well as your current work. And I'm sure everyone appreciates your time with us today, uh, pro bono as it were. And uh, thank you very much. Delightful to have you here. Very, very pro uh, pro uh, thought provoking, that's for sure. Uh, and thank you, Godfrey. Thank you for inviting me again. Fantastic. Well, that was Godfrey Bloom with some very, very interesting opinions about what's happening in the world, but well-researched opinions that come out of a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, and a willingness to see the world as it is, not the way he would necessarily like it to be. Thank you for joining me today. I'm John Butler, Investment Director at South Bank Investment Research. Uh, as most of you know, my work is very heavily independently research-based. Uh, and I get my information from all over the world. It would help if you press the subscribe button and the little bell next to it, because the more subscribers I have, uh, the more likely it is that international uh, independent research institutes will share their material with me. It's most helpful, and then, of course, I'll automatically share it with you. Uh, so, surprise, won't cost you anything. Uh, thank you very much.